Right, President Trump has returned from his overseas trip and has immediately interjected himself back into the health care debate on Capitol Hill. And meanwhile, a new report in The Intercept has uncovered shocking details about the way a private contractor, Tiger Swan, surveilled and attempted to have prosecuted water protectors and other protesters uh, who were against the DAPL pipeline. We'll talk more about that later. First, and, and we'll take any of your questions. If you have questions or comments, put them in the Facebook thread. That's where we'll, we'll be reading them live and answering them here. But uh, first, let, let's turn to Capitol Hill, which is in recess for this week. Monday was Memorial Day. Whenever there is a vacation uh, that hits one day of the week, Congress takes the entire week off. Not a bad way to live life. So they are right now in their districts uh, getting heat about the uh, Republican health care plan that was passed bef before they left. Meanwhile, uh, Senate Republicans and Senate staffers are busy at work on a brand new bill uh, that, that the Senate is trying to work on, which would then be conferenced with the House bill. Now, President Trump's intervention was to say we need to put more dollars into health care and make it the best in the world. Now, this is a curious time for President Trump to make that suggestion, given that we are many months into this process. And rather than putting more dollars into health care, the Trump plan actually takes dollars out of health care and gives them to the top 1% in terms of tax breaks. Particularly, it takes the money out of Medicaid. So it takes it from uh, the, the, the poorest and uh, neediest and, and many working and uh, middle class people who are currently on, on Medicaid, takes their health care away, uh, creates 20 million more uninsured, and moves that money up, up to the top uh, in the form of massive tax cuts on income and investments. So Donald Trump is saying, let's do the precise opposite of what my plan does. Uh, separately, he said, the Senate needs to move to 51 votes, get rid of this thing called the filibuster. He know he has suggested this in the past, and Mitch McConnell has immediately shot it down because Mitch McConnell does not have the votes in order to get rid of the filibuster. Mitch McConnell cannot, on his own, move the Senate to a 51-vote threshold. Trump may or may not know that. What I think Trump is trying to do here is to blame the Senate and its rules for what he suspects may be a failure in the future. In other words, the Senate plan comes back. It's still leaves 20 plus million uninsured. It's a massive tax cut for the rich and enough Republican senators. You only need three to break, uh, won't go along with it. And it fails. Trump always needs a scapegoat. It can't be him. His scapegoat in this case would be uh, the 60 vote threshold in the Senate or Senate Democrats for not going along with his plan. That then leads uh, him to be able to tell his supporters, the problem wasn't me. The problem was Senate rules, so we need to put pressure on the Senate to change its rules, and we need to elect more uh, Republicans who support Trump in the 2018 election so that we can get my plan through. That's how he, that's how he uh, maintains you know, plausible deniability of, of failure. But we should not rule out the possibility that uh, enough craven Republicans would be able to get together and, and push some type of legislation through. It is, it, is a, it is a slim chance. The resistance to it is strong. But it, it should not be ruled out. So if there are any questions on, on health care, we can take them briefly. Uh, on, on, the, uh, on, on the issue of uh, the Tiger Swan contractor, I would suggest people Google the, the Intercept article if they haven't already read it or, uh, or, or, or catch uh, Jank or Jordan's commentary so, so that's been done so far. Uh, happy to answer any questions on, on that report that I can answer. Uh, essentially, we got a stack of documents uh, from a contractor at Tiger Swan. We got another stack of documents uh, through a public records request, match those two, uh, to, to paint a portrait of what Tiger Swan was doing as a uh, modern uh, version of the Pinkertons. Now, you, go, you can Google the Pinkertons if you're not familiar with what they've been up to uh, or what they were up to. This, is a, uh, th this was a mercenary force in the late 19th, early 20th century that, that worked with uh, you know, coal barons and steel barons and violently suppressed uh, u union organizing efforts, strikes, uh, and, and any other populist uh, movements. This was a, 
uh, this was a, uh, a pre-Blackwater Blackwater. And so what you have now is uh, Tiger Swan is, uh, saw the success of Blackwater during the Iraq War, uh, created itself out of uh, you know, veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and now they uh, rent themselves out to these private companies around the country to do security around uh, areas where there are, there are going to be demonstrations. The, in, at, at DAPL and elsewhere, what they are now doing is coordinating directly with the actual public police. So they're, they're doing uh, both surveillance uh, and, and, and collection. They are also infiltrating these activist groups and uh, sowing dissent within those ranks uh, in, in order to try to delegitimize them. Uh, this is not my speculation. This is what uh, comes from the daily reports that Tiger Swan uh, produced uh, for uh, the pipeline uh, company that, in fact, uh, Donald Trump has been invested in in the past. So, Eric, anything, any, any, any questions we want to take on either healthcare or Tiger Swan? Yeah, um, there's a really long one about um, the budget, just all the, the cruelty, the things that are being cut, and at the same time, um, adding a lot of military spending. Um, and he wants to know how um, Trump thinks he's going to pay for all of this. And maybe you could talk about some of the uh, projections that they have in terms of growth that they, they think are going to offset it. So, first of all, on the budget, this is a document that uh, Mick Mulvaney, the budget director, has put together. Uh, it, it, ref it more reflects Mick Mulvaney's priorities than, than anything else. And it is just that at this moment. It is a document. Uh, it, it is not law, uh, and it is very unlikely to become law, and, and here is why. The last time that uh, Trump fought Congress over a budget, over, over spending priorities, he caved on almost everything uh, that, that he uh, was trying to get because Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the White House. And so if the government shuts down, they are 100% responsible in the eyes of the public for that shutdown. Donald Trump can't afford the political hit of a shutdown blamed on Republicans. What level of incompetence does that imply if you control all levers of government and it still shuts down? And so he demanded a wall. He demanded this, that, and the other thing. He got, he got none of it. The Republicans in the Congress were demanding uh, shutting down Planned Parenthood and, you know, all the things that they normally demand, they got none of it. The only thing Republicans got was a line in there that said uh, that no federal funding can go towards ACORN. Uh, as you may know, ACORN has not existed for many years. So that is a reasonable thing that Democrats say, you know what, fine, go ahead. We will ban funding to ACORN, which does not exist. Uh, and so the next time that this is coming around will be the end of September, which is just less than a year away from midterm elections, Donald Trump has previously said, we should have shut down the government last time. Th th that's how we should have gotten a better deal, because he hates being made fun of for, for uh, cutting bad deals, because he is nothing if not a, a deal maker. So he has said, We're gonna, next time we really should do it. We should shut the government down. Everybody around him, though, tells you cannot shut the government down. If he does shut the government down, Let's say he goes for it and ignores all the advice around him. He will suffer so much political pain that in order to reopen the government, he will have to cave on everything that he has wanted. So he's either going to cave up front or he's gonna, going to cave separately. So the, the budget document is clarifying in a moral sense. It is interesting to know what is in it so that you can know what a Mick Mulvaney or what a Donald Trump would do if they had unfettered power. So it is interesting in that respect. It is not a roadmap for how the government uh, is is going to be run at any time in, in the future. Okay, so, so really quickly, why make it so draconian if it's not going to get through anyway and then the Democrats can use it against him? Well, Mick Mulvaney is a uh, hardcore ideologue. Uh, you know, he is a South Carolina congressman. Uh, his seat is actually vacant right now. Uh, and there's a special election to fill it on, on June 20th, and a, a, a new poll has that race within, like, 10 points, which is shocking for South Carolina. So he's, he's, an, he's, a, you know, he, he's, a, he's a government ideologue. He's, uh, I don't want to say he's a nihilist, but he is a very, uh, he's a very committed uh, cons small government uh, conservative, and, and, and it has been his dream to cut government as much as possible. And, you know, if you're the OMB director and you have this opportunity— 
you know, you're going to you're going to you're going to take it. You're going to put your fantasy government down on paper. This is that is as close as you're going to get. Uh, and, uh, you know, he probably also believes and perhaps rightly that, you know, when you're negotiating, you start with, the, you know, your absolute dream world and then you negotiate it away. Democrats don't do that. Democrats kind of start in the middle or in the center right and then are surprised when the negotiation winds up uh, so far away from their favor. So uh, perhaps that's part of his thinking. Also, this is a very divided country, and this is a this is a base document. This is something that uh, Trump can take to his supporters and say, "Look, we we cut all of this wasteful spending. We took on Democrats." Now, w- when you get into the details of it, it turns out that uh, it would be more his people than anybody else that would that would suffer from this budget. But because it will never, uh, as far as we can tell, c- be implemented. They're not going to suffer actual pain. They would just suffer theoretical pain. So that was Martin Lee's question. Thank you, Martin. Uh, the long he had a long list of budget cuts that he felt were cruel. You know things like uh, subsistence right. uh, type of things. Right. And and Martin makes a very good point. And this is this is something that they should think about and it should be clarifying to them. But you know we'll see. Okay. Um, Ritva Laflower is concerned about the Pinkertons. Um, is there an uh, is there any violation of law? Should the ACLU be looking into this? Sounds like a huge lawsuit. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's an that's an excellent question. Um, did did the Pinkertons, uh, Tiger Swan Pinkertons, uh, step over the line here? Uh, you know, I think if if there was, let's say, an attorney general in the state or in the federal government who was uh, sympathetic. To civil liberties, then there, there, there certainly may be some uh, some cases that could be brought that would suggest that they had uh, that they had violated um, the rights of these of the, of the First Amendment rights of these demonstrators. Uh, that we we don't currently <coughs> apologies. It's bright out here. Uh, we don't currently have such an attorney general, and so uh, the the law is in many ways as political as anything else, and so. Uh, in, in, in this particular case, it's unlikely that there, that anything, you know, any cases are going to be brought. But, the, you know, I think this is something that has legs. I think that uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans who are concerned about civil liberties are going to continue to look at it. This isn't the last piece that we've done. We have a lot more documents uh, that we're going to be reporting on. Hopefully we'll continue to get more because this isn't over. And people who think, well, OK, uh, it's unfortunate that this happened to some crazy left wingers protesting out in uh, North Dakota and uh, uh, defending a Native American tribe. That's you know that's unfortunate, but who cares? Uh, in fact, this is something that impacts people all across the country. Just in eastern Pennsylvania right now, for instance, uh, just regular people in the community are uh, battling uh, a, a pipeline now uh, near near Lancaster, and uh, you know these are just regular regular folks who uh, don't want to see their their groundwater destroyed don't want to see their uh, everything torn up uh, and they are being treated in the same way uh, that the protesters at Dapple are being uh, treated and by the same company and they're uh, you know uh, they they were they were the Tiger Swan referred to these protesters as jihadis as uh, people who were ideologically and religiously driven uh, like insurgents and they predicted that after the uh, at the, the da- after Dapple was approved, that this insurgency would move to other places in the country, and therefore you need to keep Tiger Swan on uh, contract because there, there's there's some odd incentives here. Tiger Swan might not actually believe all of the things that it's putting in its intelligence reports, but it needs to uh, kind of trump up the fear in order to uh, continue the the retainer checks coming. So there's a kind of twisted set of incentives at work here. Quickly, do you want to share how the intercept came into possession of the internal documents? So we we uh, we got a tip from a from a, co- a Tiger Swan contractor uh, and a and a number of documents, and then uh, that that kind of becomes breadcrumbs that you can then file uh, Freedom of Information Act requests uh, in order to get in order to get more of these documents because as Tiger Swan coordinates with uh, public agencies and public police forces. Then, as as that as that coordination moves more and more into the public sphere, that makes it susceptible to public records requests. If if they were merely a private police force, then the only way that we would be able to get their 
to their documents would be uh, through people leaking it. And I'm, I'm glad that, that that also happens. But once they start coordinating with uh, public agencies, then we then then if we know what to look for, we can get in that way as well. This has to do with both health care and the budget. Um, D Daily Peters uh, sounds like a conservative. He says, um, you guys are getting it all wrong. Um, it's not what my country can give me. It's what I can do for my country, quoting JFK, sort of. And he's saying, if I'm able to work, I should not collect food stamps or cash assistance. Why should I be paid to sit on my ass? Why should I be paid for disrespecting my country? Let's remember... Okay, JFK again. And then he says, when you rely on government assistance, the government will enslave you. Trump is doing nothing but giving people the opportunity to move on with their lives. <laughs> opportunity, that's... What, what was the guy's name? P All right, well, we, we appreciate you here watching. Uh, you know, we appreciate your point of view. All right, nice. That's a nice photo. He look, looking pretty good. Um Look, I don't know. I don't know what to, I don't know what to tell you. I, perhaps this this guy has never been in a situation where he has needed help from from the community, uh, and the community organizes itself uh, in into a representative government uh, and and takes care of those who are less fortunate and and lifts them up. Uh, there is this bizarre myth out there that there are a certain number of people, certain set of people, who are just sitting there in, enjoying their their lives living on the dole when nothing could be further for the truth a uh, a huge portion more than half of people in this country will will spend at least a year or two uh, in poverty during the course of their life poverty is not necessarily a a, a static place it is a uh, hardship strikes uh, and you suffer you fall and and you recover that that's that's often how it happens and you and you recover with the aid of the rest of the community in the in the form of uh, of, of the government I I hope that he uh, never needs uh, any assistance throughout his life nobody really wants uh, that kind of assistance they want to they want to do it on their own and some people simply can't the elderly uh, the disabled and any decent society takes care of them I don't see that any of that as a controversial okay Richard Rush who has been a trustworthy and uh, very you know a good contributor to past conversations says that this person's name is Ray Peters and his Facebook is a big Confederate flag so I'm not sure how much you've studied ab about the period of Reconstruction when, in the South, for the first time, uh, white and black coalition governments started to actually legislate for things like you described to take care of the common good. Public education was one of the innovations of that time. And this conservative side of the argument really kind of stems from the reaction to that, which was to say, well, why should our white taxpayer dollars go to educate these former slaves who then would have options to go work somewhere other than as a uh, sharecropper on my on my farm and so they came out with all kinds of good reasons why we should not fund things like public education and then basically they apply the same logic to health care or food stamps or anything you name it with the implicit I believe anyway maybe you can tell me if you agree there's an implicit racial um, critique there when they say the people don't deserve the the benefits that they get yeah yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I, I'm actually, uh, I don't know if Eric knows this, I'm currently producing a podcast on the history of Reconstruction with, with, Ki with Killer Mike uh, he, as one of the co-hosts of it. Uh, you, if you Google it, you can find, the, find where to sign up to get alerted when, uh, when it comes out. But this is a period ran from uh, about uh, 1866 um, to about, about 1876, 1878, depending on depending on where you date it, it's usually dated with this, this compromise where Republicans agreed to give it up if they could keep, keep the White House in uh, 18, 1876. But during the, this period of, in the South, uh, black people, freed black people and, uh, re and recently freed slaves were given the right to vote and to run for office. Uh, people who had participated in the uh, rebellion uh, briefly had their uh, franchise taken away. And it was restored, in my opinion, much too soon. I don't think you should get it back your entire life you, if you uh, <laughs> committed actual treason and rebellion against country. But that was a decision that they made. But during the period uh, where this lasted, you had African-American governors, senators, House members, sheriffs, uh, and, and state legislative uh, bodies that were uh, not 
majority black but dominated by a, a, a block of black legislators uh, that then teamed up with other white Republicans who rewrote constitutions all across the South and, like, like Eric said, implemented public education, for instance. And I'll tell one quick story about freedom. He was, he was talking, the, the, the Confederate flag-waving guy was talking about freedom. In, in New Orleans, it, it was known as like a, the city of death. Uh, prior, you know, prior to the uh, Civil War and, and Reconstruction, because cholera outbreaks would rip through there, killing like massive portions of the population at a time. Nobody really knew where this was coming from, but eventually people started to suspect that it might be all of these butchers that had their uh, butcher sh- shops and and their, and their slaughterhouses kind of north in the northern end of the city and they would throw all the entrails and all the all the waste product from the slaughterhouses into the mississippi river and it would run through the city and when you would pull water from the river uh or from the well uh you would you would have pig entrails kind of sitting there in in the water and it was this disgusting putrid stuff that people had to drink and it caused uh, cholera outbreaks. So the Reconstruction Legislature in New Orleans said, you know what, let's not do that. Let's create a place south of the city where all of the slaughterhouses can exist, and that way they won't be dumping their entrails into the river. They did that. The water cleaned up. Cholera ended in, in New Orleans. The butchers then sued and said that they, it was depriving them of their God-given freedom to slaughter animals anywhere they wanted and toss their carcasses anywhere they wanted. Uh, this uh, uh, eventually went to the Supreme Court, which was known as the Slaughterhouse Cases, and it relied on the, the 14th Amendment, which was uh, enacted by the Reconstruction Congress to give freed slaves citizenship rights. And they said, we are corporations, and we demand uh, citizenship rights as well. And with those citizenship rights, we, we demand the ability to throw pig guts uh, into the river, even if that means you will end up drinking them and dying from cholera as a result. And that was the case that it's, it's a complicated legal journey, but eventually is the case that uh, le- eventually led to corporations being declared citizens. And, and, that, and that is kind of the meaning of, of freedom in, in the way that uh, people like our Confederate flag-waving friend uh, use it. We should do one more on health okay. healthcare, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, but real quickly, um, I, I don't know if I think maybe it was right to let them vote again, but the northern government should have stopped them from the wave of terrorism that they used to take away the, the right to vote for the, the white progressives in the South, which there were. Before you could get killed for being a white progressive in the South, there were a lot of white progressives in the South. There were a lot of Lincoln Republicans. Um, but they basically... Right. If it was a fair vote, then then maybe. And, you know, a way to reconcile the, the country, sure. Yeah, I mean, Lincoln said with malice toward none, right? So anyway, and then he got shot. But okay. So... Um, okay, I'm freezing up. So just can you, can you, we, the only thing we really didn't talk about was health care uh, in terms of the Q&A. So I just have a quick question. The, the Senate is working on something. The only thing I've heard about it is it's 13 white men. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us any more about it and what are its chances getting through? So the, the, the Senate bill is structurally similar to the House bill because there really is only uh, which is ironically structurally similar to Obamacare itself, because they're really, if you're not going to do single payer, then and you're going to try to go for universal coverage, there's really only one one way to do it, and that is to uh, give subsidies so that people can buy regulated plans out in the marketplace. The only disagreement between Democrats and Republicans here is how much regulation and how much subsidy. Democrat Democrats want more regulation, in other words, better plans, uh, you know, that they, they must cover a, s- a certain essential health benefits, maternity care, et, et cetera, and, and Democrats want more subsidies. Now, not enough subsidies. That's why people hate Obamacare so much, because the premiums are too high and deductibles are too high, but they want more. Republicans want uh, fewer, you know, less subsidies and less regulation. So th- they they want to open up the the possibility that existed before Obamacare for you to go out and buy what they call a catastrophic plan. But that that even is a misnomer. Uh, catastrophic plan is probably something that's very cheap every month. It's not any good if you need to go to the doctor. It's not really good if you need to go to the emergency room because the deductible is so high. But if you get into a massive car accident, it's supposed to cover a significant amount of uh, of 
that of that type of uh, trauma. The problem is that they they also come along with annual and lifetime caps. Let's say it's two hundred thousand dollars, and your health and your and your uh, health care costs run into the four hundred thousand. Now you owe two hundred thousand dollars. So, and and it's not uh, difficult to foresee a catastrophe that could cost four hundred thousand dollars. So, uh, the CBO has said that it's almost unfair to even say that those people are insured if they they have those plans is the kind of insurance you think you have it until you go to use it and then it turns out that that you don't because it's completely uh un, unregulated separately the uh republicans are fiddling with the amount of the subsidy that you'd be able to use uh to go buy these plans the cbo says that uh at the subsidies that their house is talking about people would be paying just absolutely extraordinary amounts uh in order to get in order to get coverage so uh you know that's that's kind of where they are they're 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 trying to come up with something that doesn't look brutal to their elderly uh voters while while also looking brutal enough to their base that would be satisfied uh and could say that well we finally repealed this evil obamacare so yes uh read our stuff over at the intercept uh sign up for my newsletter uh, just Google Brian Grimm newsletter. It's called Bad News. You can you can find it uh, up there on the Google. We'll have more uh, coming out about Tiger Swan over the next few weeks, and we'll and we'll bring it to you here immediately. Thanks so much, everybody.